Thank you so much for this opportunity, a chance to hear from you, a chance to focus on your word, learn more about your character and nature, and more about your plan for us individually and us as your creation. So just bless this um, study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Numbers chapter 12. Before we start, I want to take a quick, I'm going to step back and look at all five books of Moses in the context of yeah. a plot, a plot or a play or a story. And just think about they've been rescued from Egypt, free from slavery, freed from the devil's world. And they've come out and they've spent a year learning how to worship, learning how to um, praise the Lord. Then they've been organized into armies. And the next thing is to go to the promised land. You and I know the rest of the story, but let's pretend we don't. Everything's ready to go. God's directing them. God's guiding them. God's got them all covered. Next step is just go to the land that that Abraham had marked off for them. And like in a in a movie, just things go seem to go from bad to worse. Something very specific happens at Mount Sinai, and that is once they enter into the deal with God. Once they shake hands, there's no more excuses, in a sense. Um, the Israelites did complain about food and water before Mount Sinai, and God just took care of it. After Mount Sinai and after um, the law has been given and everything's been established, there's no, um, there's no leniency now. It says, excuse me, God says, you're expected to believe me. And we're just going to focus on that, believing God is what pleases God because that's faith. But not believing God is what angers God. Now we're, we're correctly comfortable in our age of grace where when we don't believe, God is still faithful. But it doesn't mean he can't be hurt. I want to toss this one thought out here just possibly for some healing. An idea that disobedience can be corrected um sin god can punish that he can demand restitution but the one thing god really can't punish or can't fix is ingratitude ingratitude is something that god it just hurts him that's all and so to realize that the creator of the universe universe is capable of being hurt capable of being sad we'll see some more examples of this tonight <clears throat> So they just went through their punishment for complaining, and they've been given more quail than anybody would ever want. And in chapter 12, new issues come up. It says, now Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian, a Cushite woman, whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. This sentence starts out with Miriam. This lets us know unequivocally that she's the ringleader. She has an issue. She got an issue with Moses. And ostensibly, the issue is this woman that Moses married. This woman is not Zipporah. Um, Zipporah was the woman, the Midianite that he married. And apparently, at some point, it's not in the Bible, he married somebody else. Now, Zipporah could have passed away by this time. Moses is over 80 years old. So, as far as I'm concerned, you know, go for it. But they had a problem with him marrying a foreigner or i'm going to say a gentile for the sake of the analogy i'm going to build later um he married a, a gentile now they had problems with mixed multitudes in the past they could have been upset with why are you doing this um zipporah like i said the last we heard of her was when she traveled with her father to mount sinai and she apparently went back uh, she left her sons with moses left their sons um this, I said ostensibly because that's not the real reason. They just use this, this um, marriage as an excuse. And they said this, this is Miriam and Aaron, has the Lord indeed spoken only to Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? 
but they're saying, who says Moses is the only one that hears from God? And of course, Miriam did hear from God. She was given the song they sang after the Christ in the Red Sea. Um, she's the older sister. Aaron's the older brother. Aaron is tagging along here. Aaron is someone who just caves in. We just know that about his nature. He can be talked into most anything. He caves in. And she's brought Aaron along kind of like uh, credibility support. You know, when you if you bring a big name person along to, to bolster your argument, she's just dragging him along. And so they're saying, who does Moses think he is? Verse 3, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men who are on the face of the earth. This verse causes a lot of people problems because if you're the meekest man in the world, the last thing you're going to say is, hi, I'm the meekest man in the world since Moses is the one that's writing this. Most people try to say that some, someone else added it later. I just think it takes a lot of meekness to submit to God when he tells you to write, you're the meekest man in the world. Um, so this scenario here, who is another famous person in the Bible that claimed to be meek? And of course, this is Jesus himself, right? Jesus himself, he said, I am meek and lowly. And we're going to see here in this short story, a real picture of Christ. God is trying to bring out Christ in Moses. And in fact, we've talked about this before, a lot of times God provokes Moses for this, the specific purpose of getting Moses to react in a Christ-like way. I believe this is part of angels training. Angels, God says, hey, look at Moses. And then God tells Moses, I'm gonna wipe these people out. And Moses responds with prayer or intercession or with, with the word. And God is able to brag on Moses. Look, you can see me coming out of Moses. And we're going to see this here, too. We have Mo Miriam and Aaron are angry at Moses. Moses as a type of Christ. And what did Christ do? He had the gall to marry a Gentile. He had the gall to marry the church. And who opposed Christ in this? All throughout Christ's ministry, he found himself reaching out to Gentiles, healing Gentiles. And, of course, his... Jewish brethren opposed him and were very angry at him. And Christ himself also said, right, that he was meek and lowly at heart. And verse 4, this is how God deals with this. The Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and Mary and said, Come out, you three, under the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. So God says, Oh, you got a problem? Let's talk. In fact, I'm going to come out and talk with you. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood on the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. This is quite a scene. The pillar of smoke that's usually over the, over the Holy of Holies just comes up and meets all three of them outside the gate. You know, and God says, oh, you want to talk? Let's talk. And he stands there and he calls Aaron and Miriam. And he said, hear now my words. This is really important key. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. God is defining the role of prophets. He says, prophets are those that I give visions, I give dreams, I give messages, I give um, symbolic things. But verse 7, my servant Moses is not so. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth. He's saying, Moses is not just any, any old prophet. Moses is somebody much, much more special. I talk with Moses one-on-one. -on -one. Mouth to mouth does not mean face to face visibly because no one can see the face of God and die. But this is saying they, they converse. And let's face it, Moses up to now has talked with God in ways that you and I probably wouldn't. But this is an indication of intimacy, not disrespect. Remember, just a couple chapters ago, Moses was saying, I can't deal with these people, kill me. Okay? He says, I speak 
with him mouth to mouth, apparently, very, very practically, openly, not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. He said, he beholds my form. He is closer. Moses is not just a prophet. Yeah, you guys are prophets. Yeah, you guys prophesy. Yeah, remember the 70 prophesy. They're all praising God and prophesying uh, when God called them together. But then God asked the question, wherefore then are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? What gave you the audacity to think it's okay to talk about talk against Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. I want to turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. And this is considered by just about everybody to be a very precise messianic prophecy. God is talking to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will rise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brethren, like unto me, like unto Moses. Unto him you should listen. This is according to all you asked of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. So I, when God first spoke from Mount Sinai, the people said, this is too terrifying. I can't handle this. And Moses was a little upset by that, but God honored it and said, from now on, you listen to Moses. I will give Moses my word and you will do what he says. And God is prophesying that someday in the future, there's going to come another prophet like Moses, one that hears my word clearly one that speaks whatever I tell him to say. Not the usual prophet that has visions and dreams and, and um, you know, thoughts from God, but someone that speaks clearly. And God says, back when you said it was too scary to talk to me, verse 17, and the Lord said, they, will, they are well spoken. He said, they were right. They couldn't handle my speaking to them. But I'll raise up a prophet from among your brethren, just like you, Moses, and will put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I'll require it of him. Someday a prophet's coming. It's going to be just like Moses, but greater than Moses. And he's going to speak my words clearly, distinctly. And anybody that does not listen to him will have to answer for that. A prophet... And he talks about false prophets after that. But this picture of the Messiah being the only prophet after Moses that speaks directly from God and hears every word God says and faithfully reproduces it, not with visions, not with symbols, <clears throat> is a picture of Christ. And back here in Numbers now, God is telling Miriam that Moses is much more special than your average prophet. He hears from me directly. We converse directly. We fellowship back and forth. How dare you speak against Moses? Verse 5, and the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud. I'm sorry, moving ahead. Um, verse 9, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam was leprous. White as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was covered with leprosy. This just instant punishment, instant sin for presuming, instant sin for attacking the one that speaks for God. And apparently, she doesn't really realize it because Aaron sees it. And Aaron says to Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly wherein we have sinned so aaron is always quick to apologize when things go bad um <clears throat> then he continues on let her not be as one dead because a leprous person was considered dead put outside the camp he said don't let her be as dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of the mother's womb in other words she apparently looked all scraggly and gnarly and nasty <laughs> 
And for the first time, verse 13, for the first time in all of this, Moses speaks. Moses has been being accused this whole time. He sits there and lets things play out. The father defends him. Isaiah 53, 7, about Jesus Christ on the cross. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to a slaughter, and as a sheep before a shear is his dumb, so he openeth not, openeth not his mouth. Moses is sitting there, not opening his mouth. He says nothing until Aaron calls out and asks for forgiveness. And now Moses, again, the character of Christ, being conformed to Christ's image, comes out of Moses. And Moses cries unto the Lord, verse 13, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said to Moses, If her father had spit on her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? So God is saying, um, I can't give her a complete break. Um, maybe I can give her time served and a reduced sentence. God is saying, she's still unclean. Even if something minor like spit from someone else had been on her, she's still unclean. Therefore, let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. It doesn't specifically say she was healed, but of course, she could not be let in if she wasn't healed at this time. So this little incident here is just indicative. It's, so many times, Moses is acting out types or modeling things of God. And when he does it properly, God lets him get away with a lot of stuff. The one time that we'll see coming up with striking the rock is when he did it improperly. And, and he destroyed the type that God was trying to present. Big problems happen. And so as a result, Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not until Miriam was brought in again. And afterwards, the people removed from Hazaroth and fished in the wilderness of, of Paran. So, Everything's happening. They're getting ready to move towards the promised land. These issues are coming up, challenging authority, challenging God's <coughs> um, de delegated authority. And so now it's getting ready to go into the promised land. There's a couple days away. Everyone should be very excited. Everyone should be praising the Lord. Everyone should be um, getting ready to move in because God has already told them the land is theirs. Go take it. They are at this point expected to walk by faith. And walking by faith is sometimes the scariest thing to do. We'd rather go back to the bad stuff that didn't need faith than get the promises of enjoying faith. Hebrews talks about the walk of faith, which leads us to the promised land, the place of rest. <clears throat> So, verse chapter 13, the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I gave unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their father, you shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All the men were heads of the children of Israel. So, these two verses give us the impression that God said, go spy out the land. And that's what it says, send men. <coughs> Let's realize that Moses is writing this book, these books. The book of Numbers is kind of a collection of other things put in before Deuteronomy. And we're going to spend more and more time jumping ahead, jumping ahead to Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy is, fills in the gaps of the rest of the four books. Deuteronomy often is the rest of the story. And in this case, we have to see the rest of the story in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Start with 1 verse 20. So Moses is explaining to the new generation what they did, what, they, what the old generation said. So you've come to the hill country, the Amorites, get ready to go in. 
Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and take possession of it, just as the Lord, your, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So Moses says this to the people. Verse 22, Then all of the people came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by which way we must go up. Into cities, which, into cities we shall come, into which cities. So the people brought the idea to Moses. Let's scout out the land. It was not God's idea. The people brought it to Moses. Verse 23, and the saying pleased me well. Moses said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I took 12 men of you, one of a tribe. So when we put these two things together, Moses apparently went to God and said, we're sending spies out into the land. What's the best way to do it? Because Moses, earlier on here, says, you know, God's already scouted out the land. It doesn't really matter what's in the land. God's promised to give it to us. It doesn't matter whether they're big or small, strong or weak, you know, prosperous, not prosperous. All those things are irrelevant. You do not need to know. And in fact, once you do know, let's face it, it's a good thing God doesn't share our future with us. Okay? When he okay. shares our future with that. us, there could be things that would... um terrorizes and <clears throat> so i'm just pointing that out because this is the the commentary of the rest of the story numbers is saying that and god says sure go ahead and do it in retrospect we could call it a mistake but in retro retrospect we realize that this was something that had to happen god has to work in their hearts he's been preparing these people you know, for the first for the, the first ten chapters, eleven chapters of numbers, ready to go. Everything's all set. But God is trying to turn them from a slave mentality into a nation a nation a concrete mentality. And it's not working because the slave mentality still has such a hold on them. They want to go back to the the evil that they know. And don't want to risk the, the a future they don't know. So we have a list of tribes here. Verse 4, there's their names back in Numbers 13. Names of Reuben, Shemarth, tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, tribe of Judah, Caleb, tribe of Issachar, Ilgal, tribe of Ephraim, Oshea. That name is important. That's the son of Nun. Benjamin, Palti, Zebulun, Gadiel, Joseph, namely the tribe of Manasseh. Remember, it always breaks Joseph up into two parts. Gadi, tribe of Dan, Emil, tribe of Asher, Sether, tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, tribe of Gad, Uel, son of Maki. We the name of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshia. So this is a cool little story here. Throughout the book of Numbers, Moses, even in, um, Ezekiel, Moses talked about Joshua and named him Joshua because that's the name he's known by. But this verse right here tells us how Joshua got his name. His name was Oshia, which means salvation. And Moses decided to change his name to um, Yahweh is your salvation. And I like to picture it this way. Moses says, hey, what's your name? And Oshia said, I'm salvation. And Moses said, no, Yahweh is salvation. By the way, that's your new name. Yahweh is salvation. Yeshua, salvation of the Lord, which of course is where the name Jesus comes from. Yeshua. So <clears throat> this is where Joshua gets his, you know, Jehoshua is shortened down to Joshua, and that's where his name actually came from. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, get you up this way southward and go up in the mountain, see the land where it is and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. Again, Moses really shouldn't be making these commands. It doesn't matter whether they're strong or weak. God said to go in. He is, um, he perhaps had his authority challenged in the previous section there and now he's not wanting to you know, sometimes a leader he is weakened by consensus. It's a famous um, phrase from Margaret Thatcher. 
consensus is the death of leadership. And maybe Moses was trying to not be the leader he's supposed to be, and he goes ahead and with this plan. So we're starting to say, well, here's, here's the reason for it, the justification for it. Um, verse 19, see what kind of land they dwell in, good or bad, what cities they be in, whether in tents or strongholds. Are they, are they strong cities? Are they tents? Remember, they don't know. They don't know. When they get there, there's a land filled with a wall of cities, which freaks them out. Verse 20 of the land is, if it's fat or lean, whether there's good woods or not, but be of courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was a time of the first, first ripe grapes. So we're talking July. So this is about two months after they, the first time they moved from Sinai. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin under Rehob as men come to Hamath. Now, God has already told them what to find in the land. He said it's a land of good and large land, milk and honey. In Exodus 3, Exodus 13. So they go in, they ascend to the south, they come into Hebron, where Ahiman, Seshai, and Talmud, the children of Enoch were. Now Hebron was built seven years before his own. We're going to focus on this verse quite a bit. First of all, Hebron is the place where the patriarchs were buried. Abraham was buried there. Hebron is a place where Abraham sacrificed there. This is a powerful reminder of God's promise. And it's, what should have happened is when the spies got to Hebron, they should have said, wow, God is faithful. We heard about this place from our great, great, great grandparents. God is faithful. Praise the Lord. We can trust him. Let's go back right now and tell everybody that God is faithful and we can take this land. They should have worshiped God right there. They didn't. They saw the, the children of Enoch were there. The children of Enoch was a race of people there that were just really huge, anywhere between uh, eight, even 10 feet tall. Uh, the Enochian race, there's some mention of the, the history in Joshua. Uh, Arba, Enoch's father, heads up a city in Joshua 21. The Anakim race, they were just very tall people, very huge. Goliath comes from this ancestrally. And so instead of Hebron being the place of worship, Hebron becomes a place where they're afraid. It'll be more about the um, Anak later, or Anak. But this little verse here says Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. What is Zon? Well, for hundreds, thousands of years, well, hundreds at least, people have said zone never existed. It's one of those things that's in the Old Testament that obviously proves Old Testament can't be trusted. Turns out, relatively recently, zone was finally discovered. It's called zone or zoan. And it had different functions, but back here, when it was first founded, it was founded as a resort place for pharaohs. It was a beautiful, luxurious place. Um, I think it's southern Egypt, a resort place that was a secret place. Pharaoh, pharaoh families, very, very high up people went to this resort place just for to get away from it all. It was a heavily guarded place, and it was a place nobody knew about. The only people that know, knew about this place's existence were people who were in the know in Pharaoh. So a lot of people try to challenge Moses as the author of our Torah of our Pentateuch. And of course, we know Moses wrote all five books because Jesus quotes from all five and claims Moses as the author. The people that would like to challenge that, this little verse here is like, what, what Hebrew, Hebrew tribesmen would happen to know the existence of Zon unless you had been raised in Pharaoh's household? So it's a fun little fact there, something that Moses felt the need to put a little timestamp on this saying that Hebron has been around even before Zone. Hebron, of course, is a place that, um, like I said, Abraham was there. Zone, um, Hebron also is mentioned in ancient Egyptian texts. Hebron is also the place that uh, 
Caleb eventually conquered the Anakim when he did go into the promised land later and it became David's capital. So verse 22, they ascended by the south, came unto Hebron. Verse 23, they came to the brook of Eshcol and cut down from that branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bore between two upon a staff. So one cluster of grapes takes two men to carry. These grapes had to be the size of soccer balls. And they're hauling this thing away. The um, <clears throat> grapes of Eshcol is the seal for the Israeli insignia Ministry of Tourism right now. They have a big giant cluster of grapes is on their seal right now. They brought grapes, they brought pomegranates. The place was called Eskral because the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel had cut down from there. So they traveled the land. They went from the top to the north. They went to um, Negev in the south and the hills of the north. They covered the region that were part of God's promise and they spent verse 25, 40 days. The term 40 days might raise a flag for you because that often is a number for judgment. Verse 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, it says, we came unto the land which you sent us and surely it is flowing with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Now there's one word, one phrase in here that should show up a red flag and it says we went to the land where you sent us so they're getting ready to blame moses because they know what the report's going to be they didn't say we went to the land that god sent us they didn't say we went to the land that we begged for you to send us because 20 nevertheless the people are strong that dwell in the land the cities are walled the cities weren't walled when abraham left they're wild now. It's been a few hundred years. Remember, we saw the children of Enoch there. So they're saying, we saw <clears throat> this is an attempt to terrify the people. They're just dropping this name Enoch. They saw some really big people there, and definitely there were some Anakim there. But they're trying to make it sound like this is absolutely impossible. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell by the mountains. Can I dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan? So they brought back this evil report. And it's designed to terrify people. Let's face it. When I choose not to obey God, I got to find a reason to justify it. They got to find reasons. And usually their reasons are emotional or fearful. And so they're stirring up the crowd. They're saying, we can't do what God told us to do. Verse 30, and Caleb still the people before Moses. Caleb stands up and says, no, no, listen. Let us go up at once and possess it. We are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go with, against those people, for they are stronger than we. If they had just marched in trusting God, it didn't matter whether they were stronger or not, or weaker or not. If you do recall the story of the fall of Jericho, it had nothing to do with military might, right? God is the one that fights the battles. We don't. But when we look ahead and see battles have to be fought and God says, trust me, you know, it's like the guy that falls down off a cliff and he's going down, going down and he finally grabs a root that's sticking out. He's hanging on for dear life and he starts praying, God, God, please help me. And he hears this voice come down from the heavens saying, yes, my child, how may I help you? And he says, God, I'm hanging here by a root. I need someone to save me. And the God says, let go and I'll catch you. And the guy thinks for a minute, then he looks back up and says, is there anybody else up there? This is human nature. And so the evil report goes on, it's worse. Verse 32, they brought the evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel. So they're starting to spread the evil report. They're starting to um, evangelize the evil report. They're trying to stir up the crowd. They're trying to spread it. They're trying to misery loves company. It says, the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. 
And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. This is where it gets, ex exaggeration gets ridiculous. This is hyperbolic. They say, we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the, and this word giants is Nephilim. What they're saying is the Nephilim, the Nephilim or the giants before the flood. These were the giants that for some unknown way, some sort of genetic perversion or um, twist, we know that the, the sons of God, the fallen angels, mankind, some sort of attempt to pervert the human gene pool. And so we know that part of the purpose of the flood was to wipe this out to make sure the human, you know, that the Messiah would be 100% human. But what they're saying here is that these giants came from back then. These are descendants of the giants, the, the perversions from before the flood. There's, these are just basically scary stories. They're trying to raise the ante, stir up the people. And we were grasshoppers. Now, we know that in Isaiah, it says the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth and we are grasshoppers. When we choose human viewpoint, we're going to become afraid. We're going to be looking at things from human perspective. We look at things from God's viewpoint. You know, the people instead should have been saying, yeah, these Anakians are huge, but they're grasshoppers because they're grasshoppers to God. They're small to God. God is great. God is good. As a result, the entire congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. These are a bunch of crybabies. They were crying because they couldn't have meat. And now they're crying because, put it this way, they have been very excited about going to the promised land. That's the whole goal. Go to the promised land, milk and honey, lots of food for everybody. But now they realize that they're going to have to step out in faith. It was easy to step out in faith when you didn't know all the details. They were better off not knowing. And they murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? We're better off dead than having to risk our lives facing these giants. Again, a statement of faithlessness. Verse 3, And why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should be prey? In other words, they're blaming God for the for what these um, giants are going to do to them. And of course, we have to exaggerate when we refuse to follow God. And it's amazing how many evil plans the world has that include the phrase, it's for the children. We can justify anything. It's for the children, right? Like, well, um, we've heard that a lot. And that's what they're saying here. Our poor wives and children, God just brought, him, brought us out here to murder us, to have us be destroyed by these giants. And they wanted to let us make another captain and return unto Egypt. So they're saying, we, we want a new leader. In the previous chapter, the comment was made, oh, is Moses the only one to hear from God? Can't we hear from God too? Now they're attacking, now the entire camp is infested with, who does Moses think he is? We're going to make another leader, another captain, and return to Egypt. We're going back to Egypt. We're going back to the flesh. We're going back to the devil. I say that because Egypt is a symbol for the devil. Every time you and I are asked to step out in faith, our fleshly reaction is, let me go back to what I know. This is why it's so hard to break addictions, because stepping out in faith means I'm going to have to deal with the situation in a brand new way. I cannot deal with the situation in the way I used to deal with it. So this is a complete upheaval, complete mutiny. In verse 5, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation, to of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, were with them 
that searched the land. These are the two minority reports. They tore their clothes and spoke to the company and said, the land which we passed through to search is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, you know, if we maintain a proper relationship with God, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land. They are bread for us. Love this phrase. They are bread for us. In American, we'd say it's a piece of cake. They're bread for us. This is easy. Easiest thing to do is eat a slice of bread. Their defense is departed from them. They have no defense. Remember when Moses, um, when the glory of the Lord lifted up, Moses shouted out that, that the glory of the Lord would, would destroy all their enemies. So with God in the picture, the fear the Israelites have is totally irrational. If you remove God from the picture, then the fear is, is rational. Their defense are departed from us, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Don't be afraid of them, but the congregation bade stone them with stones. Let's throw rocks at the, the two good reports. The good reports, when you submit to the good reports, that means you submit to stepping out in faith. It means you submit to trusting the goodness of God. It means that uh, against all of your perceptions and all of your reasoning and all of your rationalizations, you have to say, I know God is good and he's going to carry me through. They're going to throw stones at him. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these, people, will these people provoke me? How long will it be before they believe me? All the signs I've shown them, I'm going to smite them with the pestilence. I'm going to disinherit them. And I'll make of thee a greater nation, mightier than they. This is a real big offer. This is God talking to Moses. Remember the silly, incorrect children's song of Father Abraham and seven sons? How can we not sing Father Moses had seven sons? He had several children, right? Father, Father Moses. Well, this is opportunity. God says, I made a promise to Abraham. I can wipe out all these people here and I can start over with you, Moses. Start over with you, make a whole net, different set of tribes. We'll, 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 we can rebuild from scratch. Moses, you wanted to wipe them all out earlier. Then I'll have to wipe them out. You wouldn't let me. But here's how about this? You become the father of the nation. And Moses said to the Lord, verse 13. Now, Moses, again, this is a situation where the character and nature of Christ is coming out of Moses. He's reminding God of what God has said. He's reminding God of his glory. And he said, he's done this before. Verse 13, Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear about it. For you brought this people in your from among them. You wrested from the Egyptians that the Egyptians are going to hear about it. Then they will tell the inhabitants of this land. See, they have heard that the Lord was among these people. And the Lord has seen face to face, and the cloud stands over them and goes before them by day, and a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Everybody in the region knows this. They've seen it. All the stories have gotten out. These people travel, and he says, <clears throat> verse 25, And if you kill all the people as one man, the nations that you have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring the people to the land, he swore to them, he slew them in the wilderness. Well, you had a big, powerful God who got you out of Egypt, but you couldn't keep him. You couldn't maintain him. So you wiped him out and decided to hide the evidence. People are going to talk about you, God. And God loves that type of talk. It sounds cocky to us or arrogant, but reminding God of his word is always a beautiful thing. So, verse 17, and now I beseech thee, let the power of the Lord be great, according as you have spoken, saying. So Moses is going to remind God of his power. Now, it's an interesting category of power here. Let's go back to creation. We talked about creation being one of God's miracle, but a minor miracle compared to redemption. When the angels saw creation, they were in awe of God's power, the power of creation, the power to make galaxies, the, the power 
to make a, a cosmos with all the rules, but they knew nothing about God's character. And one of the purposes for humanity is to demonstrate an additional part of God's character to the angels. So Moses is going to give God a list of his powers. And the powers are these, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering. That's one of your powers, God. That's not a power the angel knew about. And you have great mercy. You forgive iniquity. and You forgive transgression. It says, by no means clearing the guilty. You don't clear the guilty, but you, you stretch it out. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. So what he's doing here, he's quoting almost exactly Ezekiel 34, 6, and 7. Because that is how God described himself to Moses. God had told Moses that, that I'm slow to anger, abundant and loving kindness. And so Moses is saying, God, you need, need to demonstrate your powers. And it's not the power of creation, it's the power of redemption. Now, when God spoke about this, he talked about third and fourth generation. And yes, that is a real thing, generational curses, the, the fact that, um, you know, certain things can go from generation to generation. Of course, Christ removes the curse. But Moses is making a little shift here. He's telling God that, because he, he says, you have forgiving iniquity and transgression and by no means clearing the guilty. I'm not saying you clear the guilty, God, but you do give people several generations to get right. He's pushing this back a little bit. And saying, yeah, wiping these people out, that's not going to solve anything, God, because all the nations will not know your glory in that case. They'll say you failed. He says, God, you have to have some mercy, have some patience. And if there's any way you can stretch this out over a few generations, um, using your own words against you in a way, as a result, verse 19, pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to your greatness of your mercy. And as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even till now. So from Egypt till now, you've been forgiving. So God, you've been a forgiving God all along. Keep on being a forgiving God. He's reminding God that he's a forgiving God. And again, this is God's pointing to Moses. And he's waving at the angels saying, check him out. Check him out. This is me coming out of Moses. Verse 20, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Again, this is Moses taking the type of Jesus Christ. He's interceding. Moses is being trained to intercede. He's being trained to be Christ-like. And God says, okay, according to your word, I'm going to judge these people based on your word. And of course, when Jesus was here, he said, I don't judge you, but my word will, my word will judge you someday. God says, I have pardoned you according to, you, to your word, Moses, but as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Um, for those of us going through Ezekiel, that's one of the themes there. God says, I would have loved to have the glory of the Lord spread through the world because of your greatness and prosperity and, um, and obedience. But if you refuse to do that, I'm going to have to demonstrate my greatness throughout the world by your destruction. One way or the other, my greatness, my glory will be demonstrated throughout the world. Verse 22, because all those men which have seen my miracles and my glory in the wilderness, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me now these ten times, and are hearken unto my voice. So God says, ten times. Some people have tried to make a list of ten things from Egypt on. Um, depending on how you want to count them, there's different ways of doing that. All God is saying that. I've told you, it's like when a mom said, I told you a million times to clean your room. I mean, 10 times they, they grumbled with God when they got for the Red Sea. All these instances of not trusting God and saying, I've had it. I'm, I'm tired of them not trusting me. They have not hearkened to my voice. So here's what we're going to do. Moses, what you said, I'm going to do. Surely they will not see the land which I swore to my fathers. 
neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. So these people are not going to see the land. Matter of fact, they said, I wish to God we died here in the wilderness. God says that's what's going to happen. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and had followed me fully, him will I bring into the land for unto he sent, and his seed shall possess it. There's a little footnote here. The Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. It says, tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. So he's saying, you said you would rather die in the wilderness, you will. But I'm going to give you a break because of what Moses said. The Lord spoke to Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? They murmur against me. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. So as we all tell them this, say unto them this, As truly as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. I'm going to do exactly what you said. You wanted to die in the wilderness? Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So I'm not going to wipe you out with a pestilence. I'm not going to just destroy you right now. But you're going to stay here and just die of old age. He says, Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Two people are going to be see get, get to the promised land. Everybody under 20 and those two. It says, but your little ones, which you said should be prey. In other words, you tried to use your little ones as pawns to tell the people, which too bad, we can't risk our babies going in. Well, your little ones are going to be the ones that get to go in. The ones that you said couldn't take the land, they're going to do it. It says, I will bring them in and they shall know the land which you have despised. As for you and your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms. That's a harsh word, whoredoms. Remember, Israel is married to Yahweh. Israel is the bride of Yahweh. Not trusting God means you're trusting somebody or something else. Trusting somebody or something else is idolatry. Therefore, when you don't trust God, you're stepping out on him. So he calls it whoredoms. I know your carcasses are wasted in the wilderness. So for 40 years, where that number 40 years come from? After the number of days in which you search the land. You spent 40 years, 40 days searching the land. And you shouldn't have. Your idea was to search the land to see how strong it was. You were better off not knowing. <clears throat> but 40 years, it says, every day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years. And you shall know my breach of promise. It says, you broke the deal. Moses spoke up for you. I'm not going to wipe you all out but I'm going to let this generation die off. I'm not going to give that punishment to the next generation. 20 years and under will eventually be able to go in. So 40 years from now, everybody that's 20 years or older, or, you know, 21 or older, will be dead. Only Moses and Caleb. I mean, I'm sorry, only Joshua and Caleb. I was going to point out that God does not mention Moses' name here, too. Moses probably thought it was an obvious oversight because naturally he was going to lead them in. Of course, you and I know that he also wasn't able to go in. Verse 35, I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it under all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in the wilderness. They will be consumed and they will die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the con congregation a murmur against them by bringing up a slander upon the land. Even those men that did bring up the evil report to the land died by a plague before the Lord. So the 10 spies that brought the evil report were wiped out immediately. The ones that started the evil report, God slew them. They started the infection, the infection spread. God showed grace to the rest of them, didn't wipe them out immediately. 
And God is going to keep his promise to Abraham. He said, we still have 12 tribes. And we'll have a final count before we go into the promised land. He says, but Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, still lived. They were allowed to continue living. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, verse 39, and the people mourned greatly. So let's make things a little bit worse before we close up tonight. When you don't, when you don't uh, do it God's way, don't try it on your own. Without God, we can't. But without us, he won't. So the people, as a result, they rose up early the next morning and got them on top of the mountain saying, oh, we're here now. We will go up into the land which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. So God has said, you failed. God has given his decree. And the people say, oh, that's bad. I'm really upset. We should have gone in. And now in an act of defiance, they say, we're going to take a step of faith. And this is a big deal in Christianity today. Faith in God's word, God honors, God promotes, God bestows. When we start having faith in ourself or faith worse, faith in our faith, you start stepping out in faith because you want to you want to believe it's true. If it's not God, it, then it's not right. You're going out in your own faith, in the power of the flesh. And these people rose up in the morning, and we're going to go for it. And Moses said, wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? Again, disobeying. God says, you got 40 years to wander and wait and die. That's the rule. That's what God said. And now you're going to disobey him again. Doing the right thing at the wrong time. I'm always telling my students, especially eighth graders, say, you need to stop doing that. I said, but I'm doing this. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I'm cleaning and organizing my binder. That's a wonderful thing, but it's not what you're supposed to be doing. Doing the right thing at the wrong time. Um, people trying to do good things without God. As you, you all heard me say, the American Atheist Society, good without God. When you do good things and it's not done in the power of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's fleshly, it's blasphemous, and it always leads to problems. And God, and Moses says, don't transgress the commandment of God, verse 42. Go not up, for the Lord is not with you. And go so you're not going to be smitten by the enemies. Now, they knew that they couldn't fight these people in the flesh. These people were too big and too powerful for them. With God, it was not a big deal. But now, in complete insanity, in irrationality, they say, we're going to go up anyway. This is blind, chaotic faith. Faith in God is not blind faith. It is faith in the character and nature of God. Blind faith, just because I got chutzpah or because I, I want to just believe it to be true, that's like New Age thinking at best and demonic at worst. For the Amalekites and Canaanites are there before you, and you will fall by the sword because you are turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Don't expect to win a battle when you're doing it in rebellion against God. Doing the right thing, you know. If God tells you to go to medical school and you say, no, I'm going to go on the mission field, don't expect God to bless it. You say, I, I have lots of troubles here in the United States. I'm going to go on the mission field to get away from my troubles. If you're not called by God, you better not. You know, trying to assume leadership or minister in a way that God doesn't want you to. It can look good on the outside, but it's rebellion. Verse 44, but they presumed to go up under the hill top. Nevertheless, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. They were not led by God. The Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, smote them and discomforted them. I love the phrase, discomforted them. It means they're no, no longer com comfortable. But what it really means, they scattered them, even unto Horma. So a, a group of crazies decided, we're going to obey God after all. And, says, and God has said, no, too late. You disobeyed me. Now I have a new set of rules for you. A new set of rules are wandering the desert for 40 years. And so 
in both cases, it was a rebellion. It was rebellion not to go in the first time, and it was rebellion to go in the second time. Um, everything that God wanted was a walk of faith. And what Israel failed to do here was to walk by faith. As a result, God says, every part of the country that is not walking by faith needs to be killed off. I need to wean that. And of course, the nation of Israel is a model for our lives on an individual level. We go through life, God gives us a walk of faith. We step out, we obey sometimes, or we don't do it sometimes. And that part, that's faithless. God has to wean it, has to purge us from it, has to chop it off, toss it away. And he, he cleans us, he makes us brand new, and makes us fit to walk by faith better and better every day. This is part of conforming us to the image of Christ, which is the number one calling all of us have as Christians. We're supposed to have faith in God's word, not faith in our faith. So this ends the first 14 chapters of Numbers. The rest of Numbers is gonna cover the next 40 years, basically. And it's gonna be incidents that happen and all the joy of going to the promised land seems like it's getting buried under because more and more descents come along, more and more, it, more, more, more issues come along, and you start to wonder if they're going to make it. But of course, the good news is they do, and our King, our God, Jesus Christ, He completed the work for us and has paid the price and paved the way, and we step out in faith with confidence and knowledge that we will make it also. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this example. Thank you for sharing this in your word. Thank you for helping us to discern between faith and faithlessness, between faith and flesh, between stepping boldly in confidence in your way, entering into your rest, or times when we end up staying in the wilderness for a while because we have things to learn. So God, just bless this time. Bless those listening right now. And just give us comfort in our wilderness and confidence in our future. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Pastor John. Hey, that Bill. was a hi. <laughs> That was a hallmark. I'm telling you, that was amazing. It really, really spoke a lot of different things to me. Mm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yes, it's a lot to digest. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm going to have to really listen to that one over and over again. Mm. Do appreciate that. Holy cow. <laughs> Holy cow, there you go. Yeah. As, as Melissa and Josh would know, God is holy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. All right. The Jews sure did not get obedience, did they? Well, you know what? The proof of this entire thing and... Other things later on in Numbers are going to demonstrate the proof that obedience can only come from the inside. Well, that's true. And without a Holy Spirit, yeah. go figure. So it can't come from conditioning. It can't fr come from some sort of Skinner-like um, teaching or training. It can't come from, here's a list of rules. Mm -hmm. on, God says, well, how about we put tassels on people and put the word of God on uh, foreheads and arms. You know, it doesn't do it until... That is 14, uh, no, no. you know, it, it just, it doesn't happen and it will not work until it's ready to What? So is mom trying to say something or? Um, we're we're going to no. jump off and go work with my mom. Okay. Thank you so much, Stuart. Your mom, mom's looking at the map. Well, my mom is looking at the map. I think they're talking about something else. <laughs> hey, Pastor John. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, with regards to the timing, you know, God's timing versus our timing, mm -hmm. how do we learn something like that? Is that something that's learned or discerned? I don't, 
you know, I, I, I'm never one. I always say, I just don't have a sense of timing, you know? I mean, I have a tune, you know, I can hold a note, but I just don't have a sense of timing. (laughs) And I'm like, well, do I, how do I know it's God's timing and, and versus my timing? Anytime in the Bible, when someone asks God, how are you going to pull this off? God always said, wait and see. Um, in the last, last week, we talked about the 70 that we got together. And this is something that, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule, but a lot of times a, a board of elders, you know, you wait until everyone's in agreement and of course, the problem is, well, if no one's, you know, nothing might ever get done if you wait for everybody to agree. But that's okay. Just waiting on God. Um, I, I think that's a very individual thing. Timing. When is it time to go? We're supposed to test the spirit. And a lot of times if God tells us something, for me, I don't have a problem pushing back a little bit. I want to make sure it's really God. You know, God, really want me to do this? Uh, um, I don't feel like it right now. I'm going to push back a little bit. But when you do that, God makes it clear that it's him, not just my imagination, or to him and not just a hunch. You, you ever know. had God tell you to do something? Oh, yeah. And I've said yes, and I've said no. You know, um, it's part of the growing process but god's interested in fellowship first and foremost um i mean timing is up to god and since you know what i want to say is it doesn't matter don't worry about it but that's that's the callous thing to say it's it's an issue in our lives you go you know when is this supposed to happen and all i can say is god's timing is never our timing um, in this story tonight, the timing was weird because God's timing was now, and they said, no, we're going to do it later. Mm-hmm. Other times, God's timing is later, and we say, we want to do it now. But that's what happened at the end of this chapter. Um, everything that God brings about in our life, the number one goal is to develop relationships, though. Obedience is actually secondary, and people are going to get upset with that. Yeah. But, wow. but, um, to to develop that rapport with God mm. and develop that trust with God mm. God can use us if we trust him God is more interested mm. in getting to know us mm. than in our behavior yeah yeah you know? and mm. faith pleases God and mm. sometimes the greatest faith we have is just waiting mm. waiting yeah. on God that's where our strength comes from and it's not our strength, it's God's strength, because I can't wait. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Relationship is first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That helps me a lot. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. And he worked it all together for the good, no matter what we do, right? Mm-hmm. For his good. For his good. <laughs> all things together for good, you know. And we, it'll it, it'll be. A million years later in heaven when we suddenly are able to see certain things that, well, because this didn't work out for me, God used it to bring someone into heaven. Right. We'll see these things all the time. What I call the inconvenience or a mishap or even a tragedy ends up building the kingdom. I have a question, but I might have missed some of the earlier part of Numbers, though. Um, when it says here that only Caleb and, and um, Joshua mm-hmm. are going to be the ones that inherit the land, at, at that point, it's like Moses is already excluded, but I don't know that we've reached the point where Moses disobeys God with the, no, not at all. No. With the rock, and, no. and so I'm just wondering, he's already saying that, and yet... Yeah, you know, Moses would have Moses. heard him say that, and Moses might have, in his mind, went, did he mean to leave what? me out? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. No, it, it hasn't happened yet. You know, because in the context there, you could easily say, well, of those 12, only these two are going to make it. Well, Moses is not part of the 12 either. That's true. That's so. true. Um, I, I, I didn't, I, I probably brushed through it quickly. We're going to keep coming back to it. But this picture of Moses being a type of Christ or enacting things that teach us about Christ is, is very, very important. And when we get to that rock story, it's, it, it's critical. Um, God is angry, not really at what Moses did, but because Moses destroyed the the type, the model picture that God was trying to create. And um, that seems to upset God more than anything else in a lot of these Old Testament stories. People get away with a lot of things as long as it's consistent with the type God's trying to paint. Ready to go? Want me to put some more cream in your eye? Sure. Let's go ahead and um, we can close with a prayer. Unless Judy has something she wants to share. No, that was great. I'm just, what? yeah, just um, gleaning from it. <laughs> yeah. Let's go ahead and close in a prayer then. So it was in a position to pray without keeping your eyes open? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just drop it, Casey. Okay, just close your hand, fold your eyes, and lead us in a closing prayer. Father, thank you for us. So far, it's better for us here anyway. We're almost home. Um, but we able to enjoy this uh, discussion today on there. And knowing when and when not to obey you. That was the big thing on there. When and when not to obey you. <laughs> Or keep us all in separate ways on there. But my brother got home safely last night. In your holy name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, we'll see you all next Monday. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay. okay, good night. See you Good night. See you good soon. Night. Bye. Bye. Good night, good night see you everybody. Folks. Oh, we're supposed to be. Oh, yeah. We're always supposed to be, guys. Yeah. Yeah.